Okay, I think. I think we are. Are we supposed to start? Give me a second. Yes, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Marcus Thiel. I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University, and I'm moderating today's talk. First off, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, FIU's Department of Politics and International Relations, the Dorothea Green's Lecture Series at the School of International Public Affairs at FIU, as well as FIU's Global Indigenous Forum. I'd like to welcome you to our book presentation and research talk on Professor Manuela Pick's research around indigenous politics, gender, and sexuality. All of these topics have increased in significance in our international relations. Uh, they are, but they are also considered somewhat transgressive, radical, and they aim to reconceptualize traditional notions of the sovereignty of states, national citizenship, and more broadly, the politics of human rights. So Professor Pig will talk for in the next 30 to 45 minutes, giving us an introduction to her research topic and preview her book, uh, Vernacular Sovereignties, Indigenous Women Challenging World Politics that appeared with the University of Arizona Press in 2018. Following that, we will have a question answer session. But let me first introduce Professor Manuela Lavinas Pick. Manuela Lavinas Pick is Löwenstein Fellow and Visiting Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science, as well as in Women and Gender Studies at Amherst College. She also is a professor at the Department of International Relations at the University San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador. She received her PhD in International Studies from the University of Miami um, in 2004. We were actually co-graduates. Um, and she received a Master of Arts in History with distinction from the University Pierre Mendes in France, Grenoble in 1999. Um, Professor Pick has written a lot of um, books and edited num uh, volumes. Um, her recent one that we're going to talk about is Vernacular Sovereignties, Indigenous Women Challenging World Politics from the University of Arizona Press that appeared just two years ago. Right now, she's preparing another monograph together with Andrew Canessa on with a great title, Savages, Citizens and Sodomites, Indigenous People and the State from Thomas Hobbes to Evo Morales. She edited a number of volumes or co-edited those, uh, most latest, um, the latest one in 2019, Sexuality and Translation in World Politics with Caroline Cotet, Indigenous Politics of Resistance from Erasure to Recognition is a special issue in the journal New Diversities, Queering Narratives of Modernity with Maria Amelia Viteri, and uh, together with me, Sexualities and World Politics, How LGBTQ Claims Shape International Relations, uh, published with Routledge in 2015. Besides that, she has written numerous peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, as well as op-eds on gender, sexuality, and indigeneity. In terms of honors and awards, uh, Professor Pick has been nominated one of the 20 new public intellectuals in the Americas. She has received a fellowship as a member of the School of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton in 2013-2014, and she received the International Studies Association's um, Scholar Award from the LGBTQA Caucus. Aside from all of this, she is really an engaged scholar activist. Indeed, um, Manuela was a political prisoner in Ecuador when she was marching at an indigenous protest in Quito. And I know that because I was part of her US rescue team. Um, she regularly testifies at the UN, U United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. And she works heavily with the Scholars of Risk organization. If she is not working and writing hard or traveling internationally for her various enga professional engagements, she can be found running through the Grand Canyon, paragliding in the French Alps, 
or hiking in the Andes or Himalayas. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and good friend, Manuela Pick. Manuela, it's all yours. And can I say, just say some one more thing, sorry, before you start, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, after, while um, Professor Pick is talking about her book and her research, I would like to encourage you to use the Q&A chat box on the bottom um, to pose any questions for later on so we can have an engaged, stimulating question and answer period. Thank you. It's all yours. Thank you for the great introduction, Marcus. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, Imanaya Runakuna, eh, hablo desde las montañas de los Andes, desde las enseñanzas de las mamas de los taitas de Abiyayala. Ashka Yupaychani Mama Transito, Nyanya Cristina y Yakukamaku. And thank you for all the organizing team at FIU, John, Marcus, Jeanette, Rigo, and Andre, and all the other organizers who made this, this conversation possible. Even though we're through Zoom, I'm very happy to be here. So in 2008, in Ecuador, something extraordinary happened. A clause requiring gender parity in the administration of justice passed in the, um, in the administration of indigenous justice, passed in the constitution. It was a new constitution passed into line 2008. It was extraordinary because it was the first time that we had gender parity in the administration of justice. Usually we have gender quotas for electoral processes, ministerial parity. But in this case, there were over 20 articles on collective rights that included the participation and interests of women and girls. And it was the first time in Latin America that a constitution explicitly talked about indigenous women and guaranteed their rights. They were never mentioned before in constitutional rights. And it was the first time in the world that a constitution required, required the participation of women in the administration of justice. So it was really an international milestone in every sense, but nobody noticed. The press didn't notice, feminist and indigenous movements didn't notice. Everybody was talking about the rights of nature in the constitution of Ecuador, which you may have heard about. And I only learned about it because Cristina Cucuri, who was one of the leaders in this process, was a good friend of mine. And I found myself in her living room in an afternoon in December, 2008. And between talking about her mother and her daughter and the neighbors, she also mentioned that they had done a bit of lobbying during the Constitutional Assembly and were able to add a little language about women in the administration of indigenous justice. And she said it among many other things as if it was one of the you know, uh, things you do through the year to keep the family going and the community going. So I asked her to repeat and to tell me the story. And I was amazed that something so important, such a milestone went unnoticed. And I started wondering to myself, why, why, is, why can something so important not be reported by anybody, noticed by any academic, by any journalist, by any feminist? And it's because it was the work of indigenous women, right? It was overlooked because it was perceived as marginal, because policy change that comes from the margin that are made for women, by, for indigenous women, by indigenous women are considered marginal. And yet this one clause fundamentally challenged the foundations of state sovereignty. So indigenous women have long been shaping world politics, but their presence, their struggles, their achievements have gone unnoticed and acknowledged in the study of international relations. So in this talk, I wanna tell you the story of what happened in 2008, what Quechua women did and how they shaped the constitution of Ecuador, because I think their story matters. And I hope to show you how their local struggles are embedded in world politics. But I also want to show you how overlooked peripheries are actually constantly changing the core, shaping the core and are central to the study of international relations. So what happened in Ecuador? there and why does it matter everywhere including in the US and in Miami. So the story starts really in 2006. Um, in 2006 there is um, one more domestic beating, one more domestic violence of an indigenous man on his partner, except the indigenous man was a congress member, Estuardo Remache. He was a member for the Pachacutic Indigenous Party but he was in particular, he was the president of the human rights committee in Congress. And he beat her because after five children, she had had um, um, 
tightening of the tubes um, to stop having children. And she had told her best friend who happened to be the lover of her husband. And she repeated to the husband. And so the husband started beating her, telling her that she was a whore, that she was trying to have sex with other men, that she was a public woman, right? And the <clears throat> level of domestic violence increased until a confrontation. She finally denounced him at the Comisaria de la Mujer in Chimborazo. It was all in Chimborazo. But his family kidnapped the young, all the kids and said, if you do not did not, uh, take away these charges, cancel the charges, you will never see your children again. And so her father lost her jo his job, her mother lost her job, she became completely isolated without her children and the pressure was so extensive and so deep that she ended up canceling all the charges. There was a bit of back and forth, but that was the situation she found herself in and had to abide to his um, conditions. And this upset a lot of women in Chimborazo. So at the national level, the case gained very little attention. Some women in Congress protested. Ramacho was suspended from office for three weeks, but then he came back to office, nothing happened. And he was not in charge of the Human Rights Commission anymore, but there was no main criminalization or persecution against him. And what this case showed and revealed or made explicit for indigenous women in Chimborazo is that they fall in between the cracks of justice. They fall in between the cracks of state justice because they're indigenous and state justice is racist. And they fall in between the cracks of indigenous justice because it is sexist and as women, they are um, discriminated against. So there, there are specifics of that case, but she could not access neither indigenous justice that was citing by her husband who was powerful, nor state justice that was ignoring her as an indigenous woman, woman, one more indigenous woman. So in 2006, when that happened, Quechua women in Chimborazo, in one of the organizations that's only really a hundred women, it's called Red de Mujeres Quechuas y Campesinas de Chimborazo. So these red organized gatherings across the province to try to figure out how to improve the lives of women because domestic violence is pervasive. There's a lot of rape, there is feminicides on the grow. Um, there is constant torture, physical, emotional, verbal. And so they, they were trying to increase from a health perspective, the situation of women. And after many gatherings, they got to the conclusion that the only way forward was not to go through the States because the state is racist and is not even protecting non-indigenous women in urban centers, rich women from domestic violence, when is it gonna protect them? But to go through indigenous justice, which was also um, useless at this stage because it's favoring men and it's sexist, but at least it's local, it's oral, it's free, and it's in Quechua. So if we can fix that justice, at least we can access it instead of the state justice, which they call archival justice. It's lengthy, it's expensive and nothing happens, much less for indigenous people. So once they had their, their solution, the, to their solution was we have to put women in charge in the administration of indigenous justice in our communities, right? Women have to be in the councils and we need to have the same amount of men and women. So they're not decorative and we don't want women to just be there for decoration, we want women to have equal decision-making power. And that was in 2006. Then the magic opportunity structure arrived in 2007 when newly elected president Rafael Correa proposed or accomplished the promise of his electoral term to do a um, constituent assembly. And it was the broadest, most democratic, most inclusive constituent assembly in the history of Ecuador as he promised. And so indigenous women organized to go present their demands at, in, in the Constituent Assembly. They tried to ally with the indigenous movement, who was very sexy saying, who do you think you are? They tried to ally with um, women. The feminist movement had a, its national meeting in Chimborazo, which is in the center of the country. But when they came to present their demands, the, the owner of the hotel where feminists were gathering said they were dirty and they could not get into the hotel. And feminists, and, and that's one of the pictures you saw them with their banner, right? The, the Quechua women with their banners coming with the Borrego and Las Espaldas. So they had to hand off their claims to the feminists. 
um, asking them to integrate since they could not come into the room. The feminists tried to convince maybe for 10 minutes the owner of the hotel and then let it be, even though they were paying for the space. So they were excluded from both sides and they were alone. And since they were alone, they're like, okay, we need to have a real uh, strategy ourselves, draw a proposal ourselves and try to go to Monte Cristi where the Constituent Assembly was taking place to present it to the Justice Commission, for instance. So they started a process of trying to draft the language. They looked, few, most of them are illiterate. So the two who were illiterate started looking online, uh, looking in constitutions, looking um, in Bolivia who was drafting a constitution, no talking on indigenous women. Uh, they looked at the Zapatista women's revolutionary law, which was useful, but it was just a declaration. And they couldn't find anywhere any language that was useful. This is the picture of them presenting their proposal to feminists in Chimborazo. So what they did was, let's gather some money, go see a lawyer in Quito. They go to Quito to see a, a female lawyer who specializes on indigenous collective rights. And they say, we want to have women's participation in the administration of justice in our communities. And the lawyer tells them, oh, well, that's impossible. I'm like, why? Because indigenous rights are collective rights, cultural rights. And women's rights are individual universal rights. And we cannot impose individual rights onto collective rights. And we cannot impose the universal onto the cultural. And they're like, but how did um, all the feminist you know, treaties that exist internationally and all of the rights that non-indigenous women achieved, how did they get them? And the lawyer went on the ramp explaining how it's a process of constructing rights and bringing them into law and framing and fighting for them and generation after generation, they become law. And they said, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to invent rights of our own. We want to invent rights for ourselves and put them in the constitution. The lawyer didn't help them. So what they did looking on lies was to combine the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which had just come out in 2007, with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, right? The indigenous women having the same rights as indigenous men on one, and indigenous women having rights to access to justice in the other. And they got, got the language of with decision-making power, right? And so the only thing that they proposed once they went to Monte Cristi was to present to the head of the Constitutional Assembly. It was a whole adventure to get to him and then hiding in cars with women legislators who would bring them in in hiding, get into the Constitutional Assembly space, present their demand to various Congress members. Long story short, at the end of the process, they're able to pass, um, mostly because the Committee on Justice, which had one indigenous person an indigenous man, Marco Andino, who refused to add women's rights into the equation. The committee said either it's indigenous justice with women's participation or we, the entire committee, will vote against indigenous justice. So he was forced against the wall. He had to abide. And about 20 articles come with the participation of women, 20 articles specifically on indigenous and collective rights. So we can go back into the details of the process in the Q&A if you're interested, but what I want to stress is the significance of that, right? Um, the process in and of itself was important because it was an empowerment. Women who had no education, who had never gone to school, most of them illiterate, were leaving their cows, leaving their fields, most of them leaving their province for the first time, traveling by bus across provinces overnight to present their demands to the corridors of power of the country to the elites of the country. And it was a very important process of self-empowerment for them to see that what they thought was legitimate could be validated and could become law, constitutional law. Even though the process of implementation could be more complicated in the long run. And the results are one unprecedented legislation, right? As I mentioned before, the first constitution in Latin America that explicitly mentions women in collective rights and indigenous women in the administration of justice. And the first internationally that starts to, at least for indigenous women, if not all women, introduce this notion of gender considerations in the administration of justice, not just how do we protect women, right? By putting them in decision-making power in justice. The second uh, milestone that's really important for us academics 
is to reconcile cultural justice with women's rights. Right? Theoretical problems sometimes get solved in practice. There's this big debate, is multiculturalism bad for women? And indigenous women showed that you can have culture and individual women's rights together, and they can actually reinforce each other instead of you know, inevitably destroy and divide each other. And the third one is a notion of um, bringing specificity into universalism. Right? Indigenous women, the Quechua women of Chimborazo were talking of democracy with diversity. They said, we want to differentiate universal rights because for urban women, maybe the shelters work when there's domestic violence. For indigenous women, it doesn't work because we have animals, we have fields, we have to be in the fields, we cannot leave our fields. And maybe we don't want to leave our fields and go be in a shelter, which feels like a jail, right? So we want uh, mechanisms to protect women's rights that are appropriated to our realities, our economic realities, our linguistic realities, our socio-communitary realities. So democracy with diversity. And this is in a nutshell, the story of what happened, but why and how does all that matters for international relations, right? So beyond the fact that it's good to tell success stories to show may all people in the world, may all broken judiciaries engage gender considerations to be fixed and to protect women across the world. And in the process, telling this story helps us to recognize the leadership of indigenous women to recognize how they're inspiring mobilization and achieving change. But beyond these success stories for inspiration, there are very specific IR considerations that I would like to develop today. The first one is the triangulation of legal accountability. When they were triangulating the local, the community, right, their own judicial, judicial structures in the community, indigenous justice, with the international system passing through the state, what they were doing was weaving three layers of legality. They're weaving interlegalities, right? So there are principles of self-determination that became intertwined between the community, the state and international law. So it's a very complex strategy of interlegality to undo the containment of sovereignty because one of the elements of sovereignty is legal authority, right? And you're moving legal authority and crossing it across levels. And this is important because they, in the process, they were making their communities accountable to international law. They were telling the state to impose these international treaties that were ratified by the state to impose them on indigenous communities. And therefore, in the process, they were making indigenous communities accountable to the international. So they were making indigenous communities international actors, right, with self-determination. So the second point in this process is to break the exclusive sovereignty of the state. If indigenous communities use their self-determination to hold themselves accountable to international law, to international human rights, this goes against the um, Schmidt and Agamben's right exception to the rule of sovereignty, meaning we have plural system of sovereignties. How I like to think about that is a cheese. Imagine the Swiss cheeses with all the holes. When indigenous communities have their own sovereignty for justice and they're holding themselves accountable to the international, it starts making holes in the sovereign, legal sovereignty of the state, right? And these holes of sovereignty, it's not the state who decides anymore, it's the indigenous community who has self-determination who holds itself accountable to the international. So that breaks the exclusive legal sovereignty of the state. And, and its third point, relocates authority, not above like in the European Union, but within. So this is another important argument that I make in this book is that in the European Union, we have had a dislocation of legal authority to the European system for decades now. And there is an abundance of studies, research, analysis of what it means and how it's undoing state sovereignty and how there's a crisis of the nation state, right? Because of supranationalism. And we have studied all of that and the implications for the Westphalian system. In Latin America, when we see indigenous peoples reinforcing and activating self-determination and having their own systems of justice, it's the exact same thing as the European Union that's happening, except of 
it's not going up to the supranational level, it's going within, right? It's this cheese with holes that's being activated. And that's what I call vernacular sovereignties, right? Quechua women, not that they thought about it, but their political practices are detaching legal authority from the sovereignty of the states, right? They're dislocating sovereignty within. So I talk about vernacular sovereignties because vernacular architecture is an architecture that adapts conventional international designs to local conditions to respond to people's needs. And it's the same with sovereignty. Vernacular sovereignties are sovereignties that are functional, that are solution oriented, that are not simply repressive policing, right? But that are adapting self-determination legal authority to people's needs on the ground. That's what I refer to when I talk of vernacular sovereignties. And maybe two more points that are important for international relations. One is the uh, how gender matters for claims of self-determination. And self-determination is another word for sovereignty. So I'm talking about indigenous women, but this is at large for sovereignty and, and gender consideration for women, LGBT, queer perspectives at large. Indigenous movements who claimed um, self-determination from states, right? We want to be autonomous from states, um, had a perspective of complete detachment. When Indigenous women come in, what they're doing is that they're weaving interlegalities. So they're not seeking an absolute detachment. They're seeking self-determination through the state with accountability to the international system. So they're using the international system to hold their own communities accountable, not to allow regimes of domination, of gender domination to be perpetuated. And in this process, Nikita Dawan talks about the state being at once poison and remedy. And that's exactly what indigenous women are doing. They're saying the state is poison, colonialism is poison, and the state is a man and it's colonial. But how can we use that poison to fix ourselves? Because just rejecting it is impossible, right? And it's um, this notion of provincializing Europe is provincializing the state. We can provincialize the state, but still get whatever is useful in it to improve our lives. And as a closing, this is all of this matters because it's theory. It's not just a case study. It's not reproducing what we know elsewhere. Indigenous perspectives, Latin American experiences are important for international relations because they permit us to do theories of state sovereignty of Westphalian regime change, right? And the relations of the national and the international. So indigeneity is theory from the periphery. And it is a site to think political theory uh, of stateness and sovereignty in particular, right? And in the last book that I, I co-wrote co with Andrew Canessa that Marcus mentioned, uh, savages, citizens, and sodomites, what we argue is that indigeneity is a category of political analysis. And as closing, um, I'll open to questions, but I just want everybody to keep in mind that what's happening, this case study that I just presented that is happening in Ecuador is also happening in Rojava, right? It's happening in the Zapatista region. It's happening in many areas where women on the ground are at the front lines of practicing and embodying new forms of practicing government. Right? And they're disturbing and they derange states to the point where Erdogan sends ISIS militias to kill all of uh, the Rojava government because they're non-state, they're feminist experiences, right? And they reframe what sovereignty is all about and what authority is all about over bodies and territory. So I have maybe open for questions now. Great. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, lots of food for thought. And I'm glad that um, you were able to cover that so succinctly. Um, we have one question already in the chat box. And I again, I want to encourage the audience to um, pose further questions into the chat box. Um, I do have some too, but I'm, I'm always um, leaving folks um, who pose a question in the chat box. I, uh, they get first priority. And so the first one is from Professor Suzanne Swingle, um, our, my colleague. Um, and she says, Hi, Manuela, this is Suzanne Swingle from Politics and Social Relations. Could you please elaborate further on the merging of collective cultural rights and, you know, women's rights, which are assumed to be individual ones? Where are these two dimensions easy to combine and where not? 
And she's particularly interested in this process, but also concrete issues, debates in this field of tension or collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, it's this notion that, um, especially uh, in Europe from, you know, everything we're seeing now with Muslim religions um, and the veiling of women and the contestation of women contesting violent states by reproducing gender violence upon their own bodies, right? And the question of whether culture can be used for women's empowerment. And the case of Ecuador is fascinating because they actually use a culture that is violent against them, that is sexist to redress their rights. So they're, they're, they're almost using women's rights to fix the culture. They're using the international to fix the local. Um, and the cultural is always local, right? Um, and always evolving. So I, I'm not sure how to go beyond that, but um, what their case shows is that it's impossible to separate the individual and the collective and that women's rights in particular uh, are feminism is inevitably about collective rights and is inevitably about territory. And I would even go further saying it's inevitably about territory. So the case of Quechua women in Ecuador is about their territorial survival, women's individual territorial bodies and lands, um, their well-being there. But if we take the case of Rojava, right, the the Syrian Democratic Union and forces and the, the femicide of Evrin Khalaf last year in 2019 by Erdogan's militias. It's the same process of silencing the collective by silencing the individual women who are at the forefront. So I think there is a weaving of feminist ideals and principles uh, being used to invent new cultures, if I may, political cultures. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Um, I just seem to have some electricity issues, so um, I may have to kind of move around in a second. But um, if they are, please um, continue to ask your question in the chat box. I. Um, I had a question myself then. I would like to know from you, so so where do you think, because indigenous politics have become more um, significant, more visible, right, globally, where do you think have they um, been particularly successful? Um, I, when I went to Guatemala, I was quite fast, it was quite fascinating to see also these kind of parallel systems of administrative justice, right, the indigenous and then sort of the state. So where is it? And then in Canada, there seems to be a lot of dynamism. Um, where do you think have they been particularly successful? And, you know, um, what role do women in particular, I mean, you made the point for women, but I'm also kind of interested in sort of the, the, the man, in, in the man's involvement. And so maybe the second part is, has there been any backlash or resistance by men, right? That we've seen, you know, with the progress for gender rights in general or LGBT rights or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a tense negotiation um, because indigenous peoples are all together, but there is also, um, this regime of gender domination that is repeated, perpetuated, and still embedded in indigenous worlds and experiences. But generally speaking, I would say that indigenous women are at the forefront of all of the indigenous struggles, whether it's the um, uh, Water is Life movement and the Nodapo pipeline, whether we are in Guatemala, in Guatemala, the Ishil women who led the process against Rios Mont for genocide and, uh, and achieved his sanction um, for crimes of genocide, which was the first time in history that a national court tried and sentenced a dictator for crimes of genocide, not an international court. Um, and Ecuador, Bolivia are probably the countries with the strongest indigenous presence in politics, in mainstream politics, right? Evo Morales being the indigenous president who led to the indigenous states. It's a concept that's presented by Nancy Postero that can be contested, but um, the implications are immense, whether we agree or not with the political agenda. And in the US too, we see indigenous women um, taking over. There are four indigenous women in Congress right now. There are probably gonna be more <laughs> next round around. 
and they're women, right? They're, they're not men and they're women who are leading the community. If you think about the missing and murdered indigenous women's movement in the United States and in Canada, uh, indigenous women are being murdered because their bodies represent the territory, right? Their bodies enable, reproduce um, the survival of territory because the individual body and the territory are one and go together. They cannot be separated, just like in Kurdistan. So the role of women, of native women in leading, uh, not the rebellion, but the, the political reframing is constant across the continent. Depending on which area lo you're looking at, you will see different actors. In Colombia right now, there are one to three activists being killed every week. Most of them are women. Uh, they're defending territories, they're peasants, they're indigenous, activists, they're Afro-descendant women, right? And they are in the same fight for territory, challenging the, the, the sovereignty of the state. So it depends what we're looking at, but I would say that all of the various women's or indigenous fronts are complementary with each other. Uh, in the US, there was a another milestone case uh, this summer. I don't know if people have been following. Um, the state of Oklahoma, the Supreme Court recognized um, the authority of indigenous peoples, Cree, Muscogee people over their lands and expanded by something like 30%, I forget the exact number, the indigenous surface in Oklahoma. It was a major win for indigenous self-determination for tribal governments, right? And a recognition that indigenous authority exists and that they have um, judiciary authority over their territory and their bodies. Thank you. And do you want to say something about sort of the role of man in that context? Yeah, so, you know, it's uh, ironic it's because the, in the Supreme Court um, in the US, the case that led to that is was a, a case of violence among men for a woman, um, of you know, women being treated as property. And violence against women is against native women is enormous. But most of the violence actually doesn't come from native men in the US, where we have data, 80% of the crimes from come from non-indigenous men and from outside the community. Right. So it's really this notion that we native women, just like native land, are disposable or wasteland that can be taken, appropriated, and trashed. So they are the at that intersection, right? Taking the intersectionality approach, they're the intersection of the individual and the collective and, and their bodies as territory, at the intersection of gender and race, right? And they're the ones suffering most violence and leading most of the resistance and taking over government. I think there is a, a lot to do with their specific um, intersection of oppression that explains their specific leadership when it comes to defending nature, to defending water, and to try to reframe legislation and justice at large. Great. Thank you. Um, we have um, at least two more questions that I see right now. So the uh, next one is from um, Brianna Hernandez. She's a doctoral student in our department. She asks, um, you mentioned indigeneity as a category of analysis. Many feminists have long spoken of gender in this way, but there are scholars who question the theoretical validity of that, those categorical claims uh, due to critiques or fears of the relationship between universalism and essentialism. How have, have you how have you supported the use of indigeneity and perhaps gender as a category? And have you ever encountered sort of that these, the categorical analysis has been challenged? And if so, how have you responded? That's a great question because what is indigeneity? Who is indigenous, right? And indigeneity is a category, an identity that is imposed by the state upon the people we call indigenous because indigenous peoples are not indigenous. They don't self-identify as indigenous even though they have to for political purposes now. They're Maya, Kiche, Maya Kikchi, Maya Kakchikel, Maya Ishil, they're Yanomami, they're Kichwa, they're Navajo, right? They are Shumash, they're Cree, uh, they're Maori. <laughs> indigenous peoples are Naga, they're not indigenous. 
we call them indigenous. And when I say we, I mean the state, the dominant society calls them indigenous. So indigeneity, what we argue in this new book with Andrew on savages, citizens, and sodomites is that this category was created with the colonial process, right? To frame those who were not Europeans. And it's a colonial category that is co-constitutive of the state of political modernity in, in the new world. Mm -hmm. So in a way where there is indigeneity, there is stateness because it's the other of the state. It's the outside of the state. So it is a category of analysis because it doesn't mean anything beyond a relationship with the state. We, of course, it means a lot to be Navajo. It means a lot to be Yanomami. It means a lot to be Kayowa Guarani. And they have worldviews and they have philosophies and they have forms of government and they have relations to the land. They have histories, philosophies, etc., languages, alphabets. That's not the point. The point is indigeneity per se. It is a political category of analysis because it's a lens through which to look at the state since it's one of these uh, mirrors that the state created for itself. And it only exists as this frame um, that the state is trying to, a border that the state is trying to create to validate itself. <clears throat> and there is nothing more dangerous to the state than indigenous people because state sovereignty seems, um, stable and well anchored and permanent, but it's actually extremely precarious. And the state is constantly trying to validate, to legitimize its sovereignty over its citizens, over its borders, right, over its economy, over its resource extraction. And indigenous peoples are the bodies and the territories that remind us that the state was not always there and that the state is not necessarily legitimate. Right, and can be contested, that there is an outside to the states, that there was a world before and that there can be a world after that is not state sovereignty. And in that sense, it's a category of analysis for international relations in particular. Great, thank you. Um, my colleague, um, John Oates, he uh, says it's a very interesting talk discussion and he has two questions. So please bear with me. First, international law is often criticized for reproducing international hier hierarchies and neo-imperial relationships. Did this come up in the case you studied? How did these ind indigenous groups draw on international law in a way that avoided reproducing these inequalities and hierarchies? That's the first one. And do you want me to pose a second or do you want to answer one sure, by one? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, the second question concerns how the indigenous movement was organized. Was this primarily a local movement or were there transnational links among indigenous groups in other countries or other movements? What role did those transnational relationships play in history? And I think that also there was one of my questions that I had sort of, you know, um, how well I mean, obviously, the uh, indigenous groups and gender groups work well together, but what about sort of more challenging relationships that I could see um, between indigenous groups and LGBT rights groups, or, you know, indigenous groups and environmental groups, right? So I don't know if you want to take all of this, but. So the transnational aspect, the easier question first, but mm -hmm. yeah, indigenous, indigenous struggles are fundamental international because indigenous is the outside of the states. Indigenous peoples have always been nations and have always been in the international. And they've always long been doing these transnational alliances, whether we're thinking about the Six Nations Haudenosaunee in the US, or we're thinking about the Quichuas uh, in Latin America, the Guaranis, right? And in current times- transcended time, borders, mm -hmm. historically, anyway. Yeah. And, and borders crosses their territories everywhere. <laughs> That's the whole point. The borders is very symbolic for them. Um, it's one of these like recent things that came and gone, it's gonna go away at some point. Um, but in more current times, if we take just the last 30, 40 years, we have one of the main sites is actually the Abiyala summit. So in the Americas, there is the um, Abiyala is the way indigenous peoples of the Americas refer to the continent because America is a colonial name. So Abiyala comes from the Kuna people in Panama. And the Abiyala summit is a process of every, it's kind of like the free trade area of the Americas meeting regularly, but they've been meeting since the 90s, since 90 or 91, every two, three years. And it's a massive meetings where indigenous communities or delegates from across the continent meet and exchange ideas and declare priorities. 
And the last one that actually took place was now five years ago, four or five years ago in Colombia. And the main priority was security and the communities agreed to take up arms and to use their justice systems and guardias to protect their territories because the state was becoming too violent with resource extraction. And the next one was gonna be in Honduras and uh, a year before it could take place, uh, Berta Cáceres was assassinated in Honduras for fighting the Hydro Dam, right? And organizing indigenous peoples. So there was a clear message to her, to indigenous peoples in uh, Honduras and Central America and across the continent. And that kind of suspended the, the meeting, but that has been a major site of interaction. The UN Forum for Indigenous Peoples, which has been taking place also for like 30 years now, is open. It's the only space in the UN that is completely open to indigenous peoples. Everybody can attend as long as you're recognized as indigenous. So there's the whole process of recognition by other indigenous peoples, etc but it's an open forum, right? And it's a massive space of brainstorming, of networking. And often you go not to meet, to discuss the UN, but to actually meet other delegates and to plan other forms of international relations. And in Latin America, there are many, many groups. So for instance, there, um, my, my former partner, uh, Yaku, who was the president of the uh, Quichua Confederation of Indigenous Peoples in Ecuador, was also after the coordinator of, of uh, CAUI, which is the Coordinadora Andina de Organizaciones Indígenas. So there is an Andean network of indigenous organization. There is another one that's an Amazonian network of indigenous organization, and they're all networking all the time. And this happens across regions, right? And across borders. Um, part of this goes back to the first question, which is the most interesting one, is that, of course, international law is the one, if we go back to the beginning for indigenous peoples, is the Christian doctrine, the, the doctrine of Christian discovery, right? And the Papal Bulls of 1493 that give authority to Spain and Portugal and to Christian um, kings uh, to colonize this wasteland and bring the infidels under Christian domain by any means necessary, right? And this is the foundation for all international system or for all constitutional systems across the new world to, to treat indigenous land or non-European land as terra nullius, as wasteland and just put your flag, impose your law, your legislation and take over, right? To take over possession, take over property, right? So one of the traditional historical ways of stealing indigenous land is that, especially with the modern states in the mid 1800s, it happened with the Allotment Act in the US. It happened in Guatemala with the creation of the National Registry for Land for Property. Everybody has to come and claim their property. And if you don't claim it, it means it's terra nullis. And of course, indigenous peoples who were not part of the states to begin with could not come and declare their property. So their properties, their territories, Los Comunes de Indios in Guatemala, for, for example, were transformed, were cut into pieces, just like in the Allotment Act in the US and turned into property. And it's fascinating because it's using international law, the Christian doctrine of discovery to turn territories, meaning sovereignty into private property, right? And how I see indigenous peoples challenging that. So the case of Quechua women that I just presented is one, but there are very interesting cases happening now. The rights of nature is one, right? So we have, for instance, the Waitangi River in New Zealand where the Maoris have been fighting for 160 years to protect the Waitangi River, right? From uh, British colonization, then New Zealand colonization. They finally achieved the authority over the river after 160 years. And what they were able to negotiate was a tripartite solution. So the river has rights of its own. It's a legal subject and it has legal personhood. Um, thanks to international legislation, encouraging the rights of nature and climate justice, et cetera. And one, the three guardians of the rivers are the Maoris who live there, um, the states of New Zealand and a committee of environmental experts, right? And the three together are in charge of protecting the river and expressing, uh, defending its rights. Then there is another example that's fascinating in North America. Um, you have the Bison Treaty, which I think is from 2016. 
um, where over 50 Native American communities made a, a treaty with the bison, right, to protect the prairies. So the bison and humans go into a treaty, right, interspecies treaty, to protect the prairies against climate change, resource extraction, etc. So of course, this is way beyond the realm of Western law, but it's nonetheless happening. So we can continue to, as you call the new imperial approach, ignoring all of that and folklorizing it, or we can try to understand um, these approaches as an expansion of international law. Uh, but these are perspectives that are seen by indigenous peoples and scholars and very marginal still in mainstream IR. But for those who are interested, Sheryl Lightfoot and David McDonald, I believe, have written about that. Um, for instance, in the special issue that I've put together in, for the new diversities, they have a piece on that. And I think they've published more recent pieces uh, this year. Great. Fascinating how, you know, these new precedents are being set that maybe through activism then eventually become part of, of international law and thereby change international law. Um, good. Um, there's another question from um, Professor Zwingle. Suzanne asks, after the milestone change in Ecuador about a decade or more ago, in how far has this constitutional provision affected the daily lives of indigenous women? Um, it's hard to measure. That's a question that I often get. And we often ask ourselves, Christina and I, and the other women who are involved in the process. There are a couple of concrete examples where um, communities would reach out to their authorities. And I've experienced it with Yaku as the president of, of, of the Kicho Confederacy. But they would say, ah, there is a legal problem here. It's usually about land or about some somebody who stole something. And the police wants to come in and they're resisting the police and they're trying to keep the matter within the community and how to go about it. And Yaku, because he was with me and following up close, and Christina in other cases on her side in Chimborazo, they would say, yes, you know, these are the guidelines from the elders' councils. And remember that you have to have women equally present and with decision-making power. If not, the state can come and cancel all of the proceedings. So there is this progressive awareness is like, oh, not to be punished and not to have whatever decision we make overthrown by the state later on, we're gonna abide to having women in charge. In some other communities, women are in charge already, right? So we had cases there, we had a case of a femicide um, in June, two years ago where the two communities in Saraguro were already led by women, like the political leaders of the two communities were women. And so they were solving the problem together and they had a bunch of women part of the, the community. So they didn't even invoke that constitutional right. So I think the maybe the most important thing of that constitutional right, the, the hardest challenge is the socialization among women who are uneducated, in the fields, working hard, facing excruciating poverty and increasing poverty now with COVID, right? Who may not be aware. So Christina did a lot of work of, of spreading the word and doing workshops, etc. And I think the new generations are more aware and more willing to use that tool. But we have to just think it's a tool, right? Like any human rights that is declared anywhere, there is the violation of the human rights, there is the inscription of the, that right into law, and there is the agency of the victims to claim that right to, right? So there's this triangulation that has to happen. And when victims are not aware or not claiming it, it goes unused and... Fantastic, thank you. Um, Ernesto Fioquetto, which is one of our doctoral students, has a question about um, the indigenous women's struggle for the rights and interlegality, so the different levels that you mentioned, the triangulation. Um, the three levels, um, naming community, state, and international level. For sure, um, the indigenous women um, face hard and different challenges at each intersection. At what level do they find more significant support for their claim, claims? And depending on which level they you know, are more successful, what strategies are more successful and does success at one of these levels imply an improvement in the situation at the other levels? 
Um, it's, it's a great question because in fact, it's not one level cannot work without the other. And that's the whole thing about intersectionality, right? We talk about interse intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw talks about it in to understand the specificity of oppression of black women in the United States in, in, the, in her analysis. But here we have also intersectionality in the positive, right? In that one of the three laws alone is useless. It's the complementarity, the intersection of the three. Because at the international level, you have nice laws at the UN, but it's just, where is the UN, right? And they're, they have no enforcement capability. Um, uh, they're not assigned to any specific country or indigenous peoples. They're just words of, you know, this is what the world should be like. And so the national state, the constitutional law is fundamental there to bring it to the territory of Ecuador. But since women, do, indigenous women in particular, do not access right and cannot, so they use actually the state level to pressure their community. So it's really the weaving of the three. They really have access to justice in the local on their territories. But it's a very sexist justice. <clears throat> in the province near Chimborazo, a female judge who has since died told me that over half of the cases of indigenous justice were cases of adultery, punishing women. That was in 2007 that she told me that. And she was saying it's dramatic to see our indigenous justice so dedicated to punishing women for sexual behavior, which often didn't even happen, right? So the, um, the challenge of emancipation, right? In, look, indigenous peoples have been colonized for so long that there is nothing that is free from Christian colonial states, patriarchal influences. And it's there, how do we revert, redress these regimes of domination, right? How do we emancipate? What does emancipation look like? And that's where the fascination is to, how do we use international law, which can be so neocolonial and there are many things to be said about the international human rights regime, right? And the human rights industrial complex. Um, but how can we use that poison as remedy? How can we use the indigenous communities that are so sexist and so violent? It took me, 10 years, like I'm, I, I got this book going, but it took me 10 years to understand why Christina was defending indigenous justice because it's a justice that's so violent against them. But yet it's immediate, it's in their language, it's free, it's where they come from. So how do we fix it, right? How do we make it work for us? And in the process of making it work for indigenous women, they're actually reinvigorating indigenous justice that had become something useless because it was not helping people's well being. And so by making it uh, useful for women, you actually reinforce it at the national level and make it a tool to resist the ongoing colonization of the state and violence of the state. So the weaving is central, the intersection of the three legalities is what makes it work. Can I personally add on to that? Um, because you just said exactly using the state, right? Then basically against itself or against the coloni colonizing influence of the state. Um, I'm almost wondering um, after reading parts of your book and you know um, talking to you many times about it, is it seems to me almost as then indigenous leaders, male or female, um, you know, get more visibility and then also enter not only indigenous justice arena, but also national political arenas. Is there some sort of almost hybrid hybridization going on in the, the state? You know, the classic patriarchal, um, you know, Latin American state is changed from within or I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. That's a good concept. We should use it. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it into the new book. <laughs> I think hybridization <laughs> is a great way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Great, great. I'm um, talking about, you know, when you said about the new book, do you want to share a little bit about your research going forward? Yes, that would be great. So, um, thank you. The, um, so this book with Andrew Canessa is um, an anthropologist who works on gender in Bolivia and has written extensively about gender politics in Evo Morales government. And I'm as a political scientist IR scholar working in Ecuador, we're kind of combining the two perspectives to make in, anthropologists look at indigeneity the impact on the state and make IR scholars look at the impact of indigeneity on sovereignty, right? And to get the two talking, to politicize indigeneity. So 
it's combining our research. It's a book of four hands and it's combining our research. We've been having conversations for 10 years and we finally put our brains together and it's putting, um, it's analyzing what it means to be indigenous and how it's a relational identity to the state and co-constitutive of modern politics. Um, and looking at this notion of the modern, right? And the savage and the modern and uh, Thomas Hobbes, right? At the beginning of the world, there was America and what it means the indigenous as being located in the past of European inevitably modernity, right? And which is still used today. And if you think about economics, right? The narratives of development perpetuate this notion that modernity has a, a location, a temporality and a location that's European. And so we take case studies from Bolivia and Ecuador, but also the rest of the world and more analytical categories like gender and sexuality. So we analyze gender and sexuality and the sodomites right, as a way to criminalize indigenous bodies and discipline indigenous families and territories. So I hope, we hope that it's gonna be a contribution that forces this political conversation on indigenous perspective, that bring indigenous perspectives into IR and that brings uh, political perspectives into uh, an anthropological approaches to indigenous relations. In that sense, um, you know, there has been an increased effort, right, particularly in the international relations community to kind of, um, increase the visibility also of Global South scholars. I think you are part of the Global South Caucus, right? Um, is Are there similar, because indig indigenous groups are then a subset, as far as I understand, from the Global South, right? So, you know, they have ethnic minorities, you have maybe racial minorities, and you have indigenous and who, who else? Mm -hmm. um, is there, do we see also a rise in sort of indigenous literature by indigenous people? And yes. do you want to maybe speak a little bit about sort of, you know, the historiography of indigenous knowledge and, and what kind of threat that may pose to, you know, our Western or Eurocentric, as you call it, um, knowledge production processes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, there is no indigenous caucus or anything yet at the, at the International Studies Association. We have to create one. Um, but I run and, the, and indigenous peoples are not taken into account in the global south for various reasons. One, because they're everywhere, um, not just in the Global South, even though they are the Global South, but they're particularly present in English literature in Canada and the United States. Um, and two, because, um, I mean, let, let me just mention some people just to, so we have an idea. There's a long history, but they're all published in English. In Latin America, just to give the example of Latin America, but in worlds that do not live and produce in English, it's very hard to have indigenous intellectuals come and produce, especially IR. IR is a discipline that's very straight jacket and disciplined in the global south and we repeat the production of knowledge of the global north and the name dropping. Right? Let's remember that over 90% of the IR production or the top journals in IR, uh, over 90% of the articles are published by scholars located in the global north in actually United States and Canada. So scholars like Cheryl Lightfoot, Jeff Corntasso, uh, Rauna Kuokanen, right? They're amazing scholars and they've been writing, uh, Cheryl has her book, A Subtle Revolution about the indigenous world politics at the UN in particular. And there are many more scholars like them. Jeff Cortasso has written about in international relations and federalism in Canada in particular. Glenn Coulter has amazing work. Audrey Simpson right, discusses this notion of the state as a man, but from indigenous perspectives and the, the relation of indigeneity with sovereignty. Uh, and Rauna is a uh, uh, is her last book is 2019 with Oxford Press. It's called Restructuring Relations. And it's about self-determination, sovereignty, and gender. She's Sami and she writes from the frontiers of Europe, right? And these people are amazing scholars. They're present at ISA conferences, but they're mostly in, invisible in, in, the conver in the debates and in the journals. Um, we hope that the climate crisis will generate some awareness that these new re these regime changes from the environmental perspective, for instance, these rights of nature with uh, 
rivers gaining legal personhood, glaciers in India gaining legal personhood, the rights of nature being constitutions is shaping international law and, and relations among states in signif significant enough ways that our, our scholars will start to engage with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think probably one of the problems I could see um, is that, you know, if they're visible, then it becomes easily exoticized or almost fetishized, right? Because it is sort of you know, very special and exotic in that sense, um, because it is so fascinating. But um, yeah, um, my my other question refers, so my next question refers sort of, because you said, you mentioned in the book, in I think in your chapter on vernacular justice, chapter five, and the relationship to sovereignty, that you think of um, indigenous justice systems and the way it it works with the state, as well as with the international levels is almost the opposite of what's happening in in Europe with the European Union, where the European Union, right, as a as a supraordinate institution with their law imprint, I sometimes use that term, you know, the European Union queer state sovereignty, right, because it kind of, you know, um, changes it from above, of course, with more power. And you say um, indigenous justice does, I think, if I understood you correctly, the opposite from its bottom up justice that then also uh, creates a different level of vernacular so sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the work of Saskia Sassen, right, the global mm -hmm. reassemblages, where there is a dislocation of sovereignty or John Agnew, this notion that sovereignty is becoming delocalized, right? It's mm -hmm. a local. <laughs> It's all true and it's all happening, but all of these perspectives are coming from the global or from the supranational. And indigenous practices of self-determination are doing the exact same thing. So it's the opposite, but it's the same. It's just that it's the same, but from a different direction. And it's going to within. And I say within and not outside because indigenous peoples, they want autonomy from the state. They want self-determination, but not to create a different state. They don't want to create a state of their own. They don't want a new state. They want a political model that is not a modern nation state, right? Which is the whole challenge, right? Uh, Rabindranath Tagore and Gandhi discussed for a long time before the independence of India, Tagore would say, we have to do something else than a nation state because if not, we're just reproducing the British bureaucracy and putting a, an Indian flag, but it's the same stuff, just with a different name, India instead of UK. And Gandhi was like, okay, it's a different thing, it's us, but how do you call that political system and how does it exist in the international system? How do you exist at the UN if you're not a nation state, right? We can think about Palestine, about Kurdistan, about Tibet. We can think about many places and indigenous nations is, are part of that. Some scholars argue that being indigenous is being colonized, nothing else. Hmm? The unicity of the claim is that it doesn't wanna become a state, but it, it wants autonomy for the state to be able to inhabit other political forms. And that's the interesting part. And so it's that's why I say that it's a dislocation of state sovereignty within, because it's not trying to be another state. But it's the same direction at the EU in that it dislocates legal authority and detaches legal authority from the nation state, which is historically, right, from Hobbes onward, the one of the traditional elements of state sovereignty in the Westphalian regime. So if that is happening across Latin America, and I would say across the world, because every place that has indigenous peoples has some level constitutionally recognized of indigenous self-determination. Indigenous justice is more or less recognized, but somewhere in every place to some degree. Some places have less indigenous justice, but have indigenous police, like the Guarani in Brazil, for instance. Other places they have rights to self-determination, other places they have quotas um, in electoral processes, but there is a recognition that indigenous peoples now cannot be just thrown under the carpet and assimilated through residential schools and genocide, right? So there's a, a, a la Trudeau in Canada, there is a, a performance at least of, of um, acceptance and tolerance of indigenous political forms. And so it's changing not just these states, but it's changing the whole world. The problem, I think, to compare to the EU is that in the EU, 
we're looking at it and we're analyzing it. In the rest of the world, nobody's looking at it. The anthropologists are doing their ethno, you know, ultra local approaches, culturizing, often folklorizing. And political scientists are not looking at it because, you know, the indigenous is apolitical. It's before the states, it's pre political, it's Hobbes, right? It's at the beginning of the world, there was America. So we're stuck in this notion that the indigenous is not political and we're failing to see the extent of political bargaining that's happening and that's reframing, reinventing Westphalia every day. Great, great. Thanks. Um, one other, yeah, I'm just checking. No, um, right now there's no other question. So I'm gonna um, ask another one of mine um, referring to your book. And it may reflect a little bit on Brianna's earlier question too, you know, sort of indigeneity as a category of analysis, because I think um, in your book, you also make clear and you somewhere, you stated very uh, precisely that you think of indigeneity really as more as a political process than some kind of essentialist characteristic, right? So yet what we see over and over again, I got the feeling, you know, is that there's at least in the US and that may be US centric view that there's a, a big deal being made of indigeneity as sort of an essential personal characteristic. I'm just Elizabeth Warren, right? And you know, like her her um, indigeneity issue comes to mind. What do you think of these these kind of uh, questions regarding? You know, is it is it is it just a process? I mean, there there is some tension, right? Considering yeah. how you consider yeah. indigeneity. Indigeneity is a process in the sense that it's a political identity. You cut your hair, you go to the city, you speak English, you're not indigenous anymore, right? Um, indigeneity is your tribe recognizing you, it's the state recognizing you, but it's first and foremost you self-identifying. And what's fascinating to go back to John's point about international law, there are many treaties about indigenous peoples now, about indigenous territories, rights to prior consultation, etc. Nowhere does it exist a definition of who is indigenous, even in the US, which is the most um, like obsessed state with defining the indigenous, there are over 50 definitions of what it means to be indigenous. And the blood quantum is one of the many. So depending of which institution you look at in the US, there's a different definition of what it means to be indigenous and who is indigenous and who is not. So scholars talk about definitional violence from the state, right? And this ability of the state to define the indigenous. So part of the international mobilization of indigenous peoples, which has been going on for two centuries since there is such a thing as the international system. Let's remember that the, the head of the Haudenosaunee Alliance, the Six Nations Alliance, went to travel to the League of Nations on a Haudenosaunee passport in 1924 to ask the League to intervene in the conflict that Canada was creating by invading Haudenosaunee Six Nations territory. And the League of Nations refused to receive him because to receive the Haudenosaunee chief in the League of Nations was to recognize its sovereignty. So they didn't let him in. He went about Switzerland giving talks, but was never allowed to step in the League of Nations. And, and this uh, denial of the indigenous has been going on and the struggle of indigenous nations and leaders has been to exist as sovereign, as self-determined nations. And nowadays, the last 50 years, when the treaty started to exist, the resistance has, we will not again be defined by the state, we define ourselves. So there is no de close definition in the international system of who is indigenous. So there is law of indigenous rights, but there is no definition of who these laws apply to. Mm -hmm. Right? Fantastic. Yeah. Which goes back to your point of what does it mean to be indigenous and who is in and who is out, and there is no answer to that, and that's the beauty, and it's the, it's what is completely ungraspable in state bureaucracies, mm. where you are either a man or a woman, and that's where indigeneity is super queer, because it's uh, across borders to begin with, right, mm. and if you are indigenous, inevitably because you've been colonized, you are also American or Canadian, so you are double national no matter what if you're indigenous so it's a permanent state of crossing borders of queerness of fluidity um, that the state keeps trying to define and indigenous people keep resisting to define wonderful you know what i think um you ended on such a high note and such a, a great um statement that kind of sums it up very nicely but you know could 
go, you can go further and further into it that I think if there are no more questions, I th and I think you have to, uh, later on you have a graduate student forum, I would say let's conclude here so you get a little bit of rest. I hope that um, you know when to go back on. But I, in the meantime, I just want to thank you for sharing the time with me and with the audience. I want to thank every all the participants and our co-sponsors. And I hope um, we'll get to talk about this in more detail at another time, hopefully in person, right? Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and for clo for closure, I wanted to send a message to everybody that there's nothing more interesting and more radical in IR now than to focus on indigeneity. So hopefully we'll just, all the students will go yeah. for it. <laughs> and, and that's why exactly they should um, go out and buy your book, right? Fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Manuela. Thanks, everyone. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.